Evening Shortcuts, Stephen here. This is video two for the first week of September. This is kind of post-punk, funk, prog, psychedelia, rock and roll and pop. There you go. And soundtracks. Bit of a smorgasbord. Hopefully you find this interesting. This I'm going to start with a, an Australian record, albeit a Japanese press of an Australian record, albeit a Japanese promo press. And you can see here it says, sample. This is a Japanese first press promo of Prayers on Fire by The Birthday Party. Nick Cave's debut album, with Mick Harvey and Roland, what's he called? Roland, forgotten his name now. Anyway, Roland and the rest of the folks. This is, I guess, a historical artifact. Our artifact. This is regularly listed on the greatest debut albums of all time. <laughs> the enemy loved this record in the UK. It's lauded. In fact, it often makes its way onto the lists of the best records of the 80s. What do you get with this record, though? Um, I think what you get is an attempt to distill one of the most iconoclastic live shows in the history. I've read about what the birthday party were like live. And... It sounds like it was an experience, um, albeit, <laughs> I guess, an experience you can't quite keep up. I mean, they they flared up and flared out, but um, this record has real, uh, it's a real Australian artifact. And I know there are some people out there who love these guys, so I thought... This doesn't necessarily need to stay with me. Now, this record I have multiple copies of. Um, but I look after my club. This is the first copy that I've ever seen that has an OB. This is Trombipulation by Parliament. This is Parliament in the late 70s entering the 80s with like a gunslinger going for it. This is the parliament that showcases Bootsy Collins. George Clinton gives Bootsy Collins some space here and he delivers. It is, it's an absolutely mad but brilliant record. Um, the, uh, the list of musicians on all the tracks, it's in, I do enjoy this uh, inner trombipulation. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing and extremely hard to find with an OB. Um, it's such a beautiful sleeve anyway, but that's Trumbipulation by Parliament, which I think is pretty bloody special. It's not my favorite record in this particular list though. This next record is my favorite. And I'm gonna focus on the sleeve. This is the Japanese first press promo of one of the great records on this label, Def Jam. I'm going to leave you in suspense. I like this. It is the debut album by Public Enemy. You're going to get yours, Sophisticated Bitch. My Uzi wears a ton. Time bomb. Too much posse. Public enemy number one. Raise the roof. Mega blast. You get a sense of the absolute mayhem that accompanied this band in the mid eighties. So I want to. I, I I love record sleeves, and this is why vinyl is so much better than other um, media. So first thing. Chuck D is dressed in Muslim whites. You get Pro Professor Griff over here in a red beret. 
you've got Flavor Flav reaching out with his hand over the turntable, but there's another hand there as well. And at the bottom, and I'll read it, can you see that text that's just there? It says, in kind of like um, text that runs along the bottom of the screen, it says, the government's responsible, the government's responsible, the government's responsible, the government's responsible. It is a manifesto. It's Chuck D declaring his view of black America in 19, whatever it is, 1987. And it totally stacks up to this day. It, I mean, the Bomb Squad, which were Public Enemy's production crew, are one of the great production crews of all time. And named appropriately, you get sirens, you get absolutely, you know, blasting drums. You get um, Flavor Flav and Chuck D, both the most, two of the most distinctive voices in the history of recorded music, um, spitting out lines that, this that will will just jar you, or and when it when it when the production is is so spare and so confronting, it means that a lot of those records, unlike a lot of the records in the eighties, that it hasn't aged. It doesn't sound. It doesn't have that tinny eighties kind of production. It doesn't have that guitar sound. That doesn't sound like a guitar. It 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 misses out a lot of the beats that make a lot of eighties records a real chore. This thing is pulverizing, and therefore rather brilliant. My favorite record in tonight's list: Public Enemy, Yo Bum, Rush the Show. What I would give to see Public Enemy back in the day. I imagine it must have been incredible, as as. The live reputation of this band is pretty special too. This is a UK first press of Black Sabbath's sixth record, Sabotage. The record that NME declared better than Paranoid. And you know what? I can hear why they think that. Um, I'm just going to show you the uh, what the UK first press looks like because it's on the Black Nems label. Um, one of the one of the things that distinguishes UK vinyl from the early to mid seventies um, to a lot of the world, or you know, other countries, you know, Japan and the US, and Germany, Australia. I'll come to Australia in a second. Is that the mixing really emphasizes the bass, and for Black Sabbath, that is a critically important thing. Um, I'll come back to another element of Black Sabbath in a second because I'm going to veer off and talk about Australian Black Sabbath vinyl in the 70s. Um, the, the care and attention that was needed to take what is essentially pretty muggy music and to create a vinyl experience that elevates the sound just didn't happen. So what you get with with particularly Australian first press and second press um, Sabbath records is that you, you don't even get the overwhelming assault of the bass. It's like it's like it's missing a, a number of instruments and the voice sounds fine. Um, when there's a guitar solo, it sounds fine. But Tony Iommi isn't about solos. It's about the dirty, sleazy riffs. And it just doesn't work. Just trust me on this. Australian Black Sabbath vinyl is just not good. If you played that US, the UK first press against the Australian first press, it is embarrassing how poor the Australian first press sounds. It really is. And it's not, if to get a copy in the, in the condition that that one's in, it's probably not far off the same price. Uh, 
If you love Sabbath, you got to get a UK first press into your collection. And that's the most affordable of the first six because, you know, the first presses of Master Reality and Paranoid and the debut record are, you know, to get a good one, it's really, really, really expensive. Um, that's a good one and it's not really, really expensive. And you will hear the difference within five seconds. Sabotage. Sabbath. Uh, I guess every so often I like to throw in something really different. And so I suspect this will be pretty new music to a bunch of you. This is Judy Driscoll and Brian Auger. Now, they were predominantly 60s, in the, on the, in the 60s scene in London. Um, kind of part of the Carnegie piece. But what I really like about them, uh, the band, the full title of the band was Julie Dis Driscoll, Brian Auger and the Trinity. Um, they're effectively a psychedelic, psychedelic, UK psychedelic pop outfit. But Julie Driscoll came out of the folk scene and you can kind of hear that but what she's trying to be she's trying to embrace a more soulful sound so what it sounds like is dusty springfield singing in front of a psychedelic pop band <laughs> but one that likes to to layer on lush strings and drama uh, brian auger was a um, keyboardist pianist an arranger um and it's a really uh it's a really thoughtful and interesting mix it's not you know it's not mainstream of course it isn't it's way off to the side but it's also rather really rather lovely and so i've got a few of their records and i thought yeah somebody might be tickled by that um yeah it's really really beautiful all right, we got. I think we got a run of classics, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, Queen's third record. This is the Japanese first press with Obi of Sheer Heart Attack. Um, I think, of course, this is the record that put Queen on the map. I do love those chrysalis labels. Now I'm here. Killer Queen. Uh, I remember, I really enjoy reading the uh, contemporary reviews of records like this, where the reviewers are kind of like, oh, it's Queen. But man, it's so catchy. And so this is a really, really nice copy. This is one of these, interestingly, Queen records are really quite difficult to find in good condition. In a night... Um, now, the opera, because of that white, white sleeve, is often kind of humidity marked. Um, this one, because it's not a full hard cardboard, it can be pretty worn, but this copy is beautiful. <laughs> How about an iconic record of the 80s that sold over 10 million copies? This is Culture Club's Color by numbers that I guess was somewhat overshadowed by the juggernaut that was Karma Chameleon, but is in effect a really fun pop record. Um, yeah, and sounds lovely, the Japanese first press, as does this. So this record is a solo project in the true sense of the word in that Bruce Springsteen played pretty much everything. There are a few snippets of the E Street Band, but this record is produced by Bruce Springsteen, written by Bruce Springsteen, sung by Bruce Springsteen, arranged by Bruce Springsteen, and most of the instruments are Bruce Springsteen. So, you know, I guess he was going for it. But when you've got songs like Tougher Than The Rest, Spare Parts, Tunnel of Love, Brilliant Disguise, no surprise, this record regularly makes its way onto the list of the greatest records of the 80s. Um, I think it's probably my personal favourite 
Brucey record. I'm not a big Bruce fan, and I am not an E Street band fan. I've never seen him live. Oh, the cheese is high with the E Street band, as far as I'm concerned. But I do like how studied and thoughtful and melodic that record is. Um, Roddy Frame of Aztec Camera was only, I think he was only 19 when he wrote the songs that appear on this. This is a record called Knife by Aztec Camera. I think it's like 81 or 82. Um, piffy, sharp, melodic guitar pop. That is ageless. Yeah. I think they're an underrated gem. And you will notice that I grab Aztec camera records whenever I can because I think they're great. Pretty simple. Okay, we got three records to go and they're all classics. And I'll start with this one. Possibly, well, I don't know if it's the greatest soundtrack of all time, but it's in the mix. Paul Simon and um, Art Garfunkel all over the soundtrack to The Graduate. Songs by Paul Simon, performed by Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, just a, an iconoclastic soundtrack record complete with Obi. I'm talking about Obi. how about this? This is a 1969 copy of the Beatles help with Obi in amazing condition and what I like about these Japanese faithfuls is what you get on the inside is kind of like the band and their signatures yeah and there's the, the Japanese there it says the back sleeve that some people think is the front sleeve but it's not so that's help 1969 sounds rather wonderful and as many of you know the Japanese presses of Led Zeppelin are rather wonderful and this is no exception this is the 1976 pressing of Led Zeppelin 4 for those of you who are Led Zeppelin fans I'm going to plant a few seeds so apparently in an upcoming box, there are two singles from Led Zeppelin that were released in Japan. One of the few jurisdictions where they actually released Led Zeppelin singles in proper picture sleeves and all sorts. I don't know which ones, but apparently there are two on the way. Well, we'll see what that's about. Apparently they sound incredible. I don't know. Let's see. If and when they get here. So that's the list of post-punk, bit of rock, bit of pop, bit of soundtrack, some psychedelia, the usual shortcuts mix. Hope you saw something interesting. As always, give me a like, a comment, a subscription. You know, reward the effort. <laughs> Anyway, hope you enjoy the videos and uh, 9 p.m. Wednesday, the price list will come out as always. Maybe something caught your eye. All right. Thanks a lot.